$5 billion, a dam taller than a skyscraper and longer than a city. Ethiopia just finished Africa's biggest hydroelectric project, one that can generate enough electricity to power a nation, but could also choke the Nile downstream. This isn't just about concrete and turbines. It's about who controls the world's longest river and what happens when Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia all stake their survival on the same water. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is about to break centuries of fragile balance, but who will pay the price? The answer begins with the sheer scale of what Ethiopia just built. Standing 170 meters tall, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam towers above the Blue Nile Valley, its concrete face stretching for 1,800 meters, longer than 16 football fields laid end to end. This is not just the largest dam in Africa. It is one of the world's true engineering giants. The structure is built from 10.7 million cubic meters of roller compacted concrete, enough to fill more than four great pyramids of Giza. At the peak of construction, teams poured up to 23,000 cubic meters of concrete in a single 24 hour window, setting a world record for a dam of this class. The price tag, over $5 billion, almost entirely raised inside Ethiopia. Every slab, every wall, every foundation was shaped by a workforce that sometimes swelled past 25,000 people. The dam's core rises higher than a 50-story skyscraper, anchoring a wall designed to withstand the pressure of billions of tons of water. Its sheer mass is visible even from space, a man-made barrier so imposing that it has altered satellite images of the region. This is industrial ambition on a continental scale. The dam's bulk is only the beginning. Behind it, a reservoir now stretches to the horizon, a new lake that will reshape the landscape and the lives of millions downstream. Lake Nigat, the reservoir behind the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, now stretches 172 kilometers, longer than the distance from Cairo to Alexandria. At full capacity, it holds 74 billion cubic meters of water. That's more than the entire annual flow of the Blue Nile at the Sudanese border. The surface area, at its widest, can swallow entire villages and forests, creating a new inland sea that appears on satellite images as a streak of blue across western Ethiopia. Harnessing this water is a powerhouse fitted with 13 turbines. Each turbine is rated at 400 megawatts, with the total output reaching 5,150 megawatts, enough to double Ethiopia's entire electricity generation overnight. The turbines are arranged in two parallel halls, fed by massive steel penstocks that plunge through the dam's concrete spine. When the reservoir is full, water drops over 120 meters before spinning the turbines, converting potential energy into electricity on a scale unmatched anywhere else on the continent. At the peak of construction, more than 25,000 workers, engineers, welders, drivers, cooks, kept the project moving day and night. Their labor transformed a remote stretch of the Blue Nile into a strategic battery for Ethiopia and potentially for all of East Africa. The sheer volume of water stored behind the dam gives Ethiopia the power to regulate the river's flow, raising the stakes for everyone who depends on the Nile downstream. In 1929, a treaty signed by Britain and Egypt handed Cairo the power to veto any upstream projects on the Nile. This agreement, written while Britain ruled Sudan and influenced much of East Africa, gave Egypt near total control over the river's flow. Three decades later, the 1959 Nile Waters Agreement divided almost all of the Nile's water between Egypt and Sudan, 55.5 billion cubic meters to Egypt, 18.5 to Sudan. Ethiopia, 
the source of more than 80% of the Nile's water, was left out of both deals entirely. The treaties did not recognize the rights of upstream nations to use or develop the river, locking in a system where Ethiopia's needs and ambitions were ignored. These colonial-era pacts still shape the legal arguments today. Egypt points to them as the foundation of its water rights. Ethiopia, in contrast, dismisses them as relics imposed by foreign powers, never signed or accepted by the countries most affected. The result is a legal and diplomatic standoff that has lasted generations. Three nations, three irreconcilable interests. Ethiopia wants to turn the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam into a regional powerhouse, targeting $1 billion a year in electricity exports to neighbors like Sudan, Kenya, and even Egypt. For Addis Ababa, the dam is more than a source of pride. It's a ticket to economic transformation, paid for by citizens who bought bonds and gave up salaries. Egypt, by contrast, faces a stark reality. More than 90% of its water comes from the Nile. The river feeds its crops, fills its taps, and sustains over 100 million people. Any reduction in flow threatens farms, factories, and the heart of Egyptian society. Cairo's officials call the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam an existential threat, warning that a single miscalculation upstream could bring disaster downstream. Sudan, caught in the middle, has shifted from outright opposition to cautious engagement. Cheap electricity and improved flood control tempt Khartoum, but the risks, unpredictable water releases, long-term ecological changes, keep its leaders wary. Meanwhile, outside powers circle the dispute. The African Union and the United States have both stepped in as mediators, but years of talks have failed to produce a binding agreement. The diplomatic chessboard remains in play, with no resolution in sight. Every paycheck in Ethiopia carried the weight of the dam. Civil servants saw automatic deductions, teachers and nurses contributed a slice of their salaries, and shopkeepers bought special GERD bonds, sometimes under quiet pressure from local officials. Across the diaspora, Ethiopians in Washington, London, and Dubai wired money home, buying into a vision of national rebirth. The government's refusal to take foreign loans meant the cost, over $5 billion, fell squarely on its own people. On the ground, new roads, clinics, and schools sprang up around the dam site. But so did rumors of mismanaged funds and backroom deals. Whispers of corruption traveled from construction camps to city markets, feeding both pride and suspicion. In the middle stood Simegnu Bekele, Simegnu Bekele, the chief engineer and public face of the project. He gave interviews, reassured the public, and became a symbol of hope. In July 2018, he was found dead in his car in Addis Ababa, a gunshot wound ending his story and igniting protests. His death left questions that have never been answered, a shadow over the dam's triumph and sacrifice. Water first pooled behind the concrete wall in July 2020. Within weeks, satellite images showed a new lake spreading across the valley. Over 200 square kilometers submerged in the first stage alone. Each year, the reservoir climbed higher, swallowing forests, fields, and entire villages as the government announced one filling milestone after another. By September 2025, the water stretched more than 170 kilometers, holding close to 74 billion cubic meters, enough to match the Blue Nile's annual flow at Sudan's border. But here's the warning scientists keep repeating. The Blue Nile carries millions of tons of silt from the Ethiopian highlands every year. With the dam blocking the river, sediment now settles in the reservoir instead of nourishing farmland downstream. 
Over time, this buildup could choke the dam's outlets and shorten its lifespan. Downstream, Egyptian and Sudanese farmers scramble to adapt, some switching to drip irrigation, others watching their yields fall as the river's seasonal floods fade away. Six turbines now spin inside the powerhouse, with the rest set to come online in phases through 2025. Each activation brings Ethiopia closer to full operation, yet the dam's control panel sits in a diplomatic vacuum. There is no binding treaty, no agreed protocol for emergency releases, and no international oversight for how water will be managed in drought or flood. The GERD's operators can decide day by day how much water to hold or release. Downstream, Egypt and Sudan wait for official notices but the ultimate decisions are made unilaterally. As the last turbines are switched on, the Nile's future hangs on a structure with no shared rulebook, only the hope that engineering and politics will not collide at the wrong moment. At over $5 billion and 170 meters tall, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam stands as Africa's largest hydroelectric project and a new force on the Nile. The documentary has shown how this massive structure, built with 10.7 million cubic meters of concrete and 25,000 workers over 14 years, transformed Ethiopia's energy ambitions and redrew regional politics. Yet, despite decades-old treaties and years of negotiation, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan have not reached a binding agreement on how the Nile's waters should be shared. The filling of the reservoir, completed in 2025, raised new questions about environmental impact and downstream adaptation, while independent reports continue to warn about sediment buildup and shifting irrigation patterns. As of today, no comprehensive accord regulates the dam's operation. The GERD's turbines may be running, but the future of the Nile, and those who depend on it, remains shaped by unresolved disputes and open files.